Doug, come on up. This is the right time for you to come up, yes. Let me pray for you. God, I thank you for my friend Doug Stevens. I thank you that you have a history with him that has transformed his life to full dedication towards you. Lord, as he preaches from his heart, Holy Spirit, we ask you'd speak through him to us, soften our hearts for the hearing of your word. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks. So I had to leave uh, abruptly after I had been here for a year and a half or whatever time it was <laughs> because there was a crisis happening somewhere else and you guys, were doing, uh, you guys were doing good. So I hadn't heard yet about the new pastor you had selected. And when I heard it was John Fanus, I said, oh no, <laughs> how could they be so lucky as to get this guy with his, uh, with his heart, with his... Uh, worldview with his um, depth of uh, insight. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here. And somebody else is glad too. I don't know where that came from, but yeah. I was listening carefully to the announcements and I see that you're having a seminar that's going to call out my worst sin. I really want to be there for that. Um, did I hear that right? It does, it does do that. Okay, good. You know, I'm busy that weekend. <laughs> you all are in a series um, that's taking you through the first five books of the, of the Old Testament, the books of Moses, the books of the law, and uh, my segment, the chapters that I'm working with, um, I've chosen to spotlight the Ten Commandments. So we're going to be looking at that uh, in this moment. Now, let me ask a question just for fun as we get started here. How many of you feel like the Ten Commandments um, are valid for us today? Raise your hand. How many of you can name all Ten Commandments? Wow. The number's reduced. So let me, let, me, let me see if I understand you. You believe in the Ten Commandments, you just don't know what they are. You can do the first two. Okay, good. Two out of ten. Uh, that's 20%. That's failing grade, by the way. <laughs> We're here in Davis. We, we do things like that. <laughs> the Ten Commandments, uh, the Constitution for the nation of Israel, the, the terms of, uh, of their relationship with God, it was given to Israel as the chosen people. It was not given to the world. It was not given to those outsiders, even though it does apply, even though it does work, because God designed us to be a certain way individually and to be in community with each other, and so they would work. But God specially chose a people. He always begins with the particular, with this small set of people, unlikely as they were, uh, people who were not powerful on the world stage, and he was going to shape them and form them into a people that could broadcast his wisdom and compassion to the whole world. So that was the plan, and so the Ten Commandments are given. So what I've done uh, up on the slide is I've re reduced the, uh, the language a bit and put them into concise form, because I can tell you're having a hard time remembering them. So here they are. So there's a preface that launches us into this constitution, this, um, this definition for Israel and for his relationship with God. It begins with, I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Now that's significant because God starts by telling us what he has already done before he asks us to do anything. He provides for us. He gives us everything we need and promises to continue to do so. Now here's what he asks of Israel. And here are the ten bullet points. The first... I'm hearing an echo of myself speaking. Cut that out. The first command <laughs> don't worship any other so called gods. Now, in all of these commands, you'll notice that the the, the framing, the language is, is, is negative. It's a, it's a prohibition. It's a proscription. This is what you should not do. But the point is to create a boundary, and inside that boundary is something worth protecting. 
some blessing, some gift that's so valuable that you want to do everything you can to guard it. So what's the blessing in this first prohibition, this first commandment, thou shalt not? Well, what's inside of that, of course, is our relationship with God, the one true living God. What's at stake is your connection with reality. Because if you're not connected to the one true God, the one who is, in fact, the authority, the one who designed all of this, the creator God, you're going to fall prey to some kind of deception, delusion, some dictator, some demon. It's going to happen. You're going to go somewhere else. So to center yourself in this relationship gets us off to the right start. It's the platform for life. So when you hear something, and it begins with a thou shalt not or do not, most of us have a little bit of a reactivity to that. We kind of step back and, and somebody's telling us not to do something. But please understand, that's because there's something worth protecting. There's something worth elevating. There's something worth, worth keeping and not losing. So that's the first command. The second command is not to fashion an image that you would worship an image of anything. The only image God authorizes is the image of God in his creation, in us, in you and me. He created humankind, male and female, in his image. And we are to be a holy hint of the reality of God. What's at stake here? Well, if you create an image and you bow down before an idol, whatever kind of idol it is, and there's lots of idols that are appealing to us right now. We have a whole variety of choices that we can make is the loss of our dignity. If we are reduced to worshiping this image that we have made with our own hands, we're going to be severely disappointed because the power is not there. It's in a direct relationship to God who gives us direct access to him. We're going to be disappointed. Ultimately, we're going to be degraded. We're going to become like the thing we make that's already lesser than us because we made it. We made it up as part of this world's system and it's going to bring us down. Our dignity is at stake. You want to be the image of God fulfilled in that sense, and you will find yourself at your finest when you are that person in that relationship. Thirdly, we are called not to, we are told not to misuse the name of God. So, what is at stake here? Well, it's our very identity because we claim the name. And the name of God has many corollaries. We have many names of God in the Bible that tell us about his attributes and his virtues and his power and the reasons why we are connecting with this God who provides all of this. And that gives us our identity. That tells us who we are. This tells us why we're here on this earth. And so you lose your sense of belonging to that God If you start using the name in a kind of trivialized or distorted or um, in some way that doesn't really honor the person and the revelation of this God. Four, we're going through this very fast. I know there's so much more here. We could do a whole series, John, on the Ten Commandments. Why didn't you consult me before you started this? Four, practice Sabbath. What is being protected? It's our rest, our renewal, our replenishment. You think you're indispensable. You miss a day of work and the world stops, right? Wrong. You think that if you can spend all of your time fulfilling everybody else's expectations of you, which you will never do, it will never be enough, that somehow that's the achievement worth going after. It's not. God has called you to do something important and he will provide the resources for you to do that and just that. Now, sometimes it's difficult. We have a a clue all the way back in the very first part of Genesis where in the scheme of Genesis, God creates human beings on day six, right? He says everything is really good. He gets to us. He says everything is good. He gets to us, and he says, oh, it's very good. We are the apple of his eye. We are the crown of creation. That's what we're worth to God. That's his estimate, not just of mankind, but of you individually. Not that you have yet reached your potential, but just it's a journey, and you're on your way, and that's God's call. That's God's, that's God's imagined future for you. 
Day six, mankind is created. On the first full day, then, of life for this race, this human race, and there's only one race, the human race, the first full day is a day of rest. And so we begin from a platform of rest, and then we go to work. We don't work to earn our rest. We're given it as a gift. Just imagine if you actually believe that and live like that so that your baseline is a baseline of, of rest, of, of, of um, a sense of being full, a sense of being taken care of. And from there now, you go out and you accomplish your call, whatever that has to be. You're not trying to prove yourself. You're not trying to, to win a hearing or win celebrity or win prestige. You don't need to do that because God has already said, you are very good. You are very valuable. You mean everything to me. I have invested everything in you. There's nothing I won't do for you. All I have is yours. That's the platform you begin from. So Sabbath is a way of honoring that. Sabbath rhythm is a way of, of, of living that is the healthy way to do that. The fifth command, honor your father and mother. Obviously, the, what's being preserved there is a sense of belonging to a family. Now, not every father and mother was wonderful. I, I understand that. And God even has backup plans. He has mother and father figures. There are others who will comprise this family of families. In fact, that's part of what we're doing here is we gather. We are brothers and sisters, and we are mothers and fathers and grandmothers and grandfathers, sometimes not even blood-related, but related because of our relationship in and through our relationship with God. And then thou shalt not murder, to put it in the old King James refrain. Don't murder anyone. We're preserving life because life is priceless. And uh, the hint behind that is that we're to treat everybody as if that's true, not simply avoiding the injuring and the wounding of them, but the embracing of them and all that they're worth according to God. Don't commit adultery. What's being preserved there? Well, love is being preserved there. Security is being preserved there in the most intimate of relationships Integrity is being preserved there. The fact that your word means something, that you can make a commitment and say, I'm going to be the same person tomorrow that I am today. I'm going to be the same person next year that I am today if God gives me the strength to do that. That is my intention. Don't steal from anyone. Obviously, all the good gifts God gives to us are being preserved by that, that God wants everyone to have their needs met. You know, this earth, as crowded as we are, or it seems that we are, seven point some billion people, can still provide. If anybody knows that, you know that in Davis because we're agricultural experts here. I don't mean we, but some of you are. And you know how much abundance is potential out in this earth. If we could only distribute it with justice, if we could share what we have, if those who have a lot, and there are some of us who have way more than we ever could imagine. A friend of mine once told me he had a very well-paying job. He said, I have, I have more money than my grandchildren can ever spend. If that's true, to whom much is given, much is required. And so not stealing, not denying those who deserve their pay, for example, not stealing from them, not doing anything ethically shady. It's all implied by that command, preserving the right for people to have what they need at the very least and to enjoy their lives. Don't lie to anyone. Obviously, we're preserving trust there. And there's no relationship without trust. There's no social contract. There's no community without trust. And we have a lot of broken trust right now. This, this, this command hits us hard because it's hard to know who you trust. Who's telling the truth? And what is truth, after all? You can almost hear Pilate asking that question again from his cynical point of view. What is truth? We live in a post-truth society. And finally, the last one, don't envy what others have. What we're preserving there is that sense of contentment, of peace. I can relax. I have enough. I have what I need. I don't have everything, but I'm not in competition with other people. I was doing fine until I saw what you had. I was doing well until I saw what you had achieved. 
All of that is just like an acid drip on our soul. The Ten Commands are preserving such important quality of life for all of us. Not, for just, not just for us individually, but for us as a community. Now, I have a bit of a rebellious streak in me. I went to Cal Berkeley, so that maybe explains some of that. But there might be others in this room that have some streak of, a, of, of rebellion in you. Um, you don't like other people telling you, anyone telling you, uh, even an authority telling you what to do or what you can't do. I was hiking up above Nevada Falls in Yosemite. I hope you've done that. It's beautiful. And you come to the very top after hiking up, and there's a railing right next to, I mean, literally right next to the falls. You can kind of look, almost look over the edge, hundreds of feet down. There's roar of water going across, very powerful, um, mesmerizing even. And then you kind of come around the corner, and then above is, a, is a, a kind of a gentle stream that feeds this waterfall. If you go 20 to 30 feet up the, uh, the pathway a little bit, there's still a railing. And next to the stream, just before it, there's a sign that says, if you try to cross this stream, you will die. Now, that kind of provokes me. I feel somewhat insulted by that exactly. First of all, you don't know who you're talking to here. I am a stream-crossing, boulder-hopping genius. If I want to cross this stream, I could cross this stream. It might not apply to everybody. There are some awkward, unathletic people out there. I'm sure there are many here this morning. But to me, I can, I can do this. So this law does not apply to me. I never even thought about crossing this stream until I saw the sign, and now I want to do it more than anything. I have to do it now. I have to cross this stream. Anybody else sick like that? Sometimes the law itself becomes provocative because we like to do what we, uh, what we like to do. Everything's falling apart here. <laughs> we don't like to be restricted. We believe in autonomy. We believe in independence. We even believe in being our own person. I want to be the self-made man or woman, in my case, a man. The sovereignty of the self is a prevailing philosophy right now in many, among many of us, and it's part of my own nature, frankly. I have, to, I have to fight against that. And the sovereignty of the self becomes the will to power because I'm not content with simply doing my thing. I want to kind of involve us and maybe manipulate us and influence us and, and force you, if I can, to do it my way. If only you would adopt my agenda, everything would be fine in this world. And then that becomes a war of all against all. And that seems to be our experience too much of the time. This is about building healthy, thriving, flourishing community. What does it take? God knows he designed us. God knows he has a, a vision for what this world would be if we are living like this, living in shalom, living at peace with each other, living to, in support of each other, living even to serve each other. And so we need these boundaries, these commands, these laws. Now, you have to trust the source, the one who's telling us this. There is such a thing as illegitimate authority, abusive authority, um, authority you don't want to pay any attention to that deserves rebellion. But this is the God who has delivered you out of Egypt, Israel, speaking to Israel. This is the God who made you. This is the God who has invested gifts in you. This is the God who provides all the elements on this earth for your benefit and for your goodness. This is the God who's just beginning to reveal who he is and what he's ready to offer to this favored human race. He begins with Israel, and then it spreads. Then the word goes out. Israel is to be a light to the Gentiles, and these commands reinforced later by the prophets who come after the lawgiver, Moses, and they remind Israel, which often forgets because they are often lawless and rebel, yes, and totally self-focused, and so they're not living this way. Let's continue reading the passage because the Israelites have a reaction when the Ten Commandments are presented. When the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain enveloped in smoke, they trembled in fear. There's two kinds of fear now coming up in this passage. 
The first is the fear that this is God. <laughs> Look at all these special effects that are created around the personality of God. I guess we have to take this seriously, okay? Continue to read. They stayed at a distance, kind of a holy reverence, because this is God who is speaking. They said to Moses, speak to us yourself. After all, you're just Moses. You're, you're a mere man. And we will listen to you, but do not have God speak to us, or we will die. There is such authority here that to oppose God is futility. To oppose God put yourself, makes yourself an enemy of the one who is in charge of all this. Continuing, Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. Yes, have a holy reverence. Yes, understand how heavy his presence is and how powerful he is. But don't be afraid because God has a loving purpose behind what he is doing here. I think we, we have to stop for a moment and say, do we believe that? Do we believe that God has a loving purpose? Or is he the cosmic killjoy? Is he going to ruin my life by preventing me from going after what I think I want, what I think I need? After all, my appetites must be satisfied. My instincts must be fulfilled. I must go after my heart's desire. As we sang about earlier, we need to override that and maybe trust an authority that is the highest possible authority and has a benevolent purpose in mind. God has come to test you. All right, to test me, to see if I'm actually responding so that the fear of the Lord will be with you to keep you from sinning. Then the last line, the people remained at a distance, still uncertain, just like some of you sitting here this morning. You're here, you're sitting here in a place called church, but you're kind of keeping your distance, kind of keeping God at, at, at arm's length. You're not sure quite what to do with this. That's Israel. That's a natural human reaction. There's a lot to ponder here. This is not to be entered into lightly, this, these terms of engagement with God. Moses, however, approached the, th the thick darkness where God was. When Peter, a follower of Jesus, suddenly caught a glimpse of the character of God in the Son of God, in the person of Jesus, he fell to the ground. He'd been with him a little while. He'd been hanging out, been observing him a little bit from a distance. But he got up close and personal, and he fell to the ground, and he said, depart from me because I'm a sinner. Suddenly, Peter's own sense of his own unworthiness, unholiness caught up with him. Now, Peter was schooled in the Ten Commandments. He knew them. He also knew that he hadn't quite risen to the occasion. He didn't quite match up. And, of course, if anybody would know that, it would be Jesus, this teacher, this prophet, this Messiah. He would know that Peter was not all that Peter pretended to be. And Peter was pretty good at faking it, probably as good as anybody in this room, although some of you are pretty good at it. We do learn to fake it. We do um, pretend that we're going in that direction. And that pretension must be ended. That hypocrisy actually must be exposed. And that's a terrifying experience to be exposed. I, I, I don't care for that myself. I was at a eulogy. I was at a memorial service with my dad. We were listening to a eulogy for a friend of his. I, I didn't know the man, but I was learning about him by listening to his best friends talk about him. And one of the things that came up in the eulogy was a remarkable achievement of a 40-year perfect attendance pin that he wore proudly for never missing church. 40 years, every Sunday, always in church. He had a pin to prove it. I turned to my dad and I said, never missed a Sunday? Didn't he ever take a trip? Didn't he ever go on a vacation? And my dad kind of whispered to me, he said, yes, he, he did. But he would go to church wherever he was, whatever country it was in or state he was in, and he would get the bulletin from the church, and he would have the pastor sign it, and he would bring it back home, and his record was intact. Forty years perfect attendance. Pretty impressive. Can't imagine doing it. Wouldn't want to do it. And then somebody else got up and talked about his friend, and he said, I've known him for years and years. I never, ever heard him cuss, ever. 
I turned to my dad and I said, damn. <laughs> never got angry? Never had a crossword? Never said something inappropriate? Come on now. And the service ended shortly thereafter, and I'm thinking, I know what this guy didn't do. I know that he didn't get into trouble. I know that he didn't create any scandal. But what did he do with his life? You see, the boundaries are put up so that you can highlight, you can emphasize, you can celebrate these good things that need to happen. Did he ever go out of his way to help anybody? Was there ever any sacrifice on his part for the benefit of other people? Did he work for righteousness and justice? And there, were, there was none of that. It was just he avoided the, causing the problem that would create at least the appearance of sin in his life. Self-righteousness, pride, whatever we call it, is probably the, the greatest enemy and the greatest inhibition in our relationship with God. So we have these commands. And by the way, the Old Testament has other commands. And we fall short. And it's crucial that we admit that we fall short. In fact, when the Messiah arrives, the New Testament comes, Jesus now makes a commentary on the Ten Commandments. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. So we have this amazing wave of love where God creates and God sets up his people and God blesses his people and God delivers his people. We have this response of fear because we're not sure we can match up to what he expects of us. We're not sure we're worthy of this, that we're living a life worthy of this. And into this crisis comes Jesus of Nazareth. And he intensifies the crisis. The expectation may have been that he would sort of dismiss the Ten Commandments and insert something else easier to follow, that there would be some kind of accommodation. That would be our wish. That would be our self-fabricating Messiah if we could do it. But he intensifies it. You claim that you have never committed homicide, but do you have hate in your heart? You have broken God's law. You have violated your brother, your sister. If you discriminate, if you have prejudice, if reacting in a way that is chronically unforgiving, you're harboring hate in your heart. Wow, that just cuts to the quick. I feel deeply convicted as that happens. You've never committed adultery, but you've fallen into lust, your own private fantasy, and you're treating others, treating women as objects. You have broken the law. You um, have never outright lied, but you've sort of um, fudged, hedged the truth. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Speak directly. So Jesus intensifies the Ten Commandments, and he accelerates the tension that we feel until we're at such a desperate place. We're like Peter falling on the ground, crying out for mercy. And that's exactly the right place to be, devoid of all self-righteousness, now completely open to whatever gift God has for us, which he's been waiting to, in fact, you might even say dying, to give us. And so Jesus, the only innocent man who ever lived, the only perfect person who ever lived, dies the death we deserve, and extends to us the gift of new life, perfect, restored relationship with God. And our response is to give ourselves to him, is to love him in return. And when we do, he powers us now. He gives us a new heart to enable us to live this way, to practice this right here, to practice this and then perfect it so we can show the world the wisdom and the compassion of God and change the reputation we, we have right now. The prophets came along and reminded the Israelites of what the lawgiver had given them. The church, as we gather together, this family reminds us of the power of God 
going, ready to be used by us, ready to power us into the relationships that may have become broken or frayed or neglected or whatever has happened. Jesus reduces the 10 to two, two great commands. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. One of the church fathers, Augustine, said, love God and do as you please. Like what? Seriously? Yes, but love God. And so if you belong to him, you won't hurt anybody. You won't do any of these things. You won't, you won't breach the boundary. You will only bless. You will only become the gift if you are that person. Love God and then do as you please, and you'll be that blessing. So you're focused on that relationship. You're centered on him, and then you're cultivating these relationships, and you're, you're lifting up others, and you're bringing others together, and your range is expanding. Until all people get from you is this love of God. You're reminding them of Christ himself walking the earth. And together, because it has to be done together because you can't love all by yourself. This is not something a monolith can do. You have to be in relationship, and late relationships are messy. And so this is difficult. And so once again, we can't do this by ourselves. We need God's help. And we cry out for that. And he promises to provide, and he will be there, and he will make up what we don't have. He promises. In Austin, Texas, where I live now, our daughter's been begging us to come to Austin for several years, so finally we came. Only after she reassured us there's only one thing wrong with Austin, surrounded by Texas. So we showed up there, and I'm now in a new kind of season of my life. And one of the things I'm doing is I'm the chaplain for the Williamson County Bar Association. My daughter's a, a, an attorney in Austin. And her husband, my son-in-law, is a judge in Austin, which uh, gets kind of intense sometimes. Your son-in-law is the judge. I always refer to him as your honor when I see him. No, I don't. <laughs> he was elected four years ago. He's up for re-election now. Four years ago, he beat a man in a very tight race. The two of them, these two men, Ryan, my son-in-law, and Terrence, the other man, um, are part of, they're both Christians. And they're part of a ministry to other lawyers and judges and the staff of various legal organizations. And I'm the chaplain in that organization. So I watch Terrence and Ryan relate to each other. They were rivals. It was a hard-fought contest, even a bit bitter at times, I think, as it got to, if you can imagine such a thing in our world. And Ryan won by a little bit. And then they got to know each other. They didn't really know each other before that. They've gotten to know each other. They've become friends. I've heard them affirm each other publicly in front of other people. I've watched them develop a strong partnership that makes the ministry stronger because of who they are. Now, one is white and one is black. One is Republican and one is Democrat. One uh, took the election and the other lost the election. And I'm so impressed with the way they've both handled it, but especially Terrence. I went up to him one day and I said, Terrence, uh, I, I watch this relationship that you and Ryan are developing. I love what I see. I'm so impressed. Uh, I said, you're a witness to the rest of us, especially in a broken world. I said, um, how do you do it? How, how, do you, how, how, how did this happen? He said, well, of course that's what I'm going to do. What else would I do? And I could think of a lot of other, th other ways he could handle it or mishandle it. And but for him, there's no other way. There really is no other choice. Of course, there are many choices. God has given us a terrible gift of free will. We can go a different direction. We can rebel against all of this. But if we choose to use our freedom to serve other people, you end up showing the world what it can't hardly believe is possible, that God is real, that God is love, and that love can be ours, can be expressed, can win over the whole world if we would allow it to. Imagine the power in this room to do that. We need a new heart to follow these commands. We need a new heart to, to have the desire to do what God is calling us to do. And that is available to us as soon as we give our lives to Christ. Would you pray with me? Oh, Lord, there's a, there's a lot here. 
There's a, an explosion here of truth. Almost impossible to digest because normally we don't allow ourselves to surrender to anyone or anything unless we come to trust you as we are considering doing again this morning. We have to recommit ourselves every day to live in your love. You create the momentum. You came first with that love. Grace is prior to anything else that we're called to do. And then we can live into it. We can go with that flow and live this out, not because we are fulfilling a duty, but because we have a new desire to be like you, to be in relationship with you, so much so that our our contact with you rubs off on us and we become followers and a representation to the world that badly needs to hear this good news. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.